All right, Luke 13, verse 6 is where we're going to begin. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Father, we thank you for your presence today, Lord. As we get into your word, we ask for revelation. I want you just from your heart to the Father's heart, say, Lord, give me revelation. Lord, give me revelation today. Speak to my heart today. Father, I ask that you'd help me to be able to release what you've put in my heart today as I share with your people. Let it go forth like an arrow appears to each heart that's in this room, each person that's listening online. Lord, let them receive from you today to hear your voice, not my voice. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. 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 You can be seated. Look at the person next to you and say, it's time for class. <laughs> All right, we're going to do a little teaching up front. This is going to be good for you. I'm going to point out some things maybe you've never seen before. How many like coming to church and you just learn? Amen. Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, let's start right here. Luke 13, verse 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree. Everybody say fig tree. Fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. This fig tree right here is Israel. All right, so let's go to the very next verse. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on, of Israel on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? How long was Jesus' ministry? Three and a half years, right? He said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, for three years I've come seeking fruit of Israel, and I haven't found any fruit for three years. You get it? His ministry was for three and a half years. For three years I've been seeking fruit and found none. Now verses 8 and 9. But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that you can cut it down. And we know that Israel rejected Jesus, right? They crucified him, right? Now we're going to go forward, Luke 14, 15 through 23. We're going to tie all this together in just a moment. So we go to the very next chapter. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. All right, just keep, we're going to keep going through this pretty quick. There's a lot of verses here. Then he said to him, A certain man, so this is the parable, red letters, A certain man gave his, a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. So he has this great supper. I want you to see this picture. We're going to read through it, and then we're going to go back and I'll explain it. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. Everybody say excuses. I want to point this out. You'll see in just a minute why. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have, to have me excused. All right, verse 19. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. There's room at this supper table. Then the, the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. It's interesting that when everything is free and everything is provided, here come the excuses. Did you see the excuses? Excuse number one, I've bought a piece of ground, but I need to go see it. Who buys a piece of ground, then you check it out later? Terrible excuse, right? <laughs> I bought the second excuse, I bought five yoke of oxen, but I need to go test them. Who buys a car and test drives it later? Terrible excuse, right? Excuse number three, I've married a wife. He blames the wife. The dude is on his way to marriage counseling right at the beginning. Are you with me? <laughs> right out of the gate. I married a wife. I can't make it. It's her fault. Notice all he wanted to do was bless these people with this great supper. Go out and get them. And excuse after excuse after excuse. No requirements. No hoops to jump through. Just this great supper. Now let's break it down. Luke 14, 21. We're going to back up. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly. It says, no, but there are all these excuses have come in. Go out quickly into the streets and lanes. Everybody say streets and lanes. <laughs> streets and lanes of the city and bring in, in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. So when Jesus is, is speaking, when he's teaching with a parable, some people it just goes, Shoo! 
but today you're going to receive what he was saying. Are you ready? When he says streets and lanes, streets and lanes are not modernized. So he's telling us that the Father has invited people to this great supper in the days of old. You see this? Streets and lanes. Now go to verses 22 and 23. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. So the days of old, he took care of that. Verse 23, then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that, they, that my house may be filled. So I want you to get this picture. God, the Father, is inviting all of us to this great banquet. Come be a part of my family. And what do we hear on Sunday morning and when we invite people to church? Excuse after excuse after excuse. Are you with me? That's what this is talking about. So we talked about streets and lanes. That means it's not modernized. That's in times of old, he was inviting people. And then it says highways. Highways is more modern. So that means that still today, God is inviting people. Come to this banquet. Come to this great supper. This, you don't have to jump through any hoops, all right? It's the table of grace. Somebody say amen. amen. So then what are the hedges? Hedges are fences or walls. It's the bamboo curtain, the iron curtain. Right now, the gospel is reaching beyond barriers that used to be in the way. Because of the internet, because of just people traveling, the gospel can reach every corner of the earth, right? So that's what this is talking about. So it started with Israel. The gospel went to Israel and they rejected Jesus. So he sent his son to go out and bring in every tribe and tongue from every corner of the earth for this great supper of free blessings. They're invited to the table of grace. So he says streets and lanes, highways, hedges, I've sent, sent out everybody. No, there's nothing standing in the way anymore. They're all coming in, right? So in chapter 13, he says, please give me more time. And now Jesus has provided everything that we need. He's done it all. It's a finished work on the cross. It's a free gift. Everybody say free gift. Free gift. And still today, men are making excuses. God is saying, come on in. I've got this table of grace prepared for you. Come on in. And we're, ah, I don't know if I really want to go. And here come the excuses. Now Luke 15, verses 3 and 4. So he spoke this parable to them saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? We just sang about that, didn't we? Hmm. <laughs> I want you to pay attention to this. Chapter 13 says, give me more time. He says, I gave you three years. He says, give me more time. They still rejected Jesus. Chapter 14 says, everything is provided. Every, there's a great banquet. The supper is set for you. The cross, the crucifixion, the resurrection, everything is yours. You just have to freely receive it. But here come the excuses. They still rejected him. So how lost is man? Very lost. Most of the time, people don't even know they're lost. So look, look at verse 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? This sheep doesn't even care that it's lost. In fact, he may not even realize he's lost. Lost people don't care many times. They don't even know it. They're just wandering through life. The good shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one that doesn't even know he's lost. Were you found? <laughs> Amen. <Yeah. laughs> Amen. Wandering around, messing up your life, all, all kinds of crazy things going on, right? Every sheep cut off from the shepherd will die, either from the attack of the wolf or the cold weather. But any sheep that wanders off and is off by themselves is going to die. The danger of being off on your own is if the sheep falls over, many times it can't get back up. A sheep in the natural, if it's wool, if the fleece gets too wet, sometimes it's too heavy to even get back up, or if it's pregnant, or if it's just plain heavy, it's fat, or right, sometimes it can't get back up. So it's safer to fall close to the shepherd than off by yourself. Do you see this? If it falls close to the shepherd, the shepherd can help it get back up to, up to its feet. That's why the sheep are supposed to stay in the fold around the shepherd. So I'm preaching now, don't miss this. If you mess up and fall, you're much better off to be around other sheep and the shepherd than to be off on your own. Are you with me? I'm not going to be mean, but I want you to listen. I have to tell you the truth. When you stop coming to church and have wandered off, when you fall, you're more likely to get attacked by the wolf because you're by yourself. A sheep that falls on its own can't do anything but just lay there and cry. Here's an interesting fact about sheep. You can look this up on YouTube. They cry. 
They do. They cry for their lost loved, one, loved ones. I wonder why God called us sheep. Because they literally cry when one has wandered off, a loved one or a friend, and they can't find them anymore, and they're still in the fold, but one, they've lost one, a family member, they literally cry. It hurts us when you don't come to church. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you from my heart. Is that cool? When people say, ah, I'm going to take six months off, or I'm not, com- I'm not going back to church anymore, it hurts the other sheep, doesn't it? You're like, man, I, I really love so-and-so. I wish they'd come back to church. And you try to get them back, and, and they don't want to come back. It hurts us. That's what people don't realize. It hurts the heart of a pastor. God has, because he's made me a pastor, he's given me a different heart. Are you with me? Yep. An evangelist has a different heart. A preacher has a different heart. D- different d- prophet, just different people have different hearts. He's given me the heart of a shepherd to take care of you. That's because he put me as a pastor. Does that make sense? Hope I'm explaining myself. It hurts us when, when you miss. All right? You doing all right? Let's go to verse 5. Luke 15, verse 5. And when he has found it, he lays it on his, shoulder, on his shoulders rejoicing. Remember we talked about the, the high priest in the Old Testament had power in his shoulders? Picks up the sheep, puts it on his shoulders. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders. He doesn't even make the sheep walk back. All the sheep has to do is rest. Is that cool? What's the shepherd's reaction? How does he carry him back? Rejoicing. Everybody say rejoicing. rejoicing. That's so cool. Is he mad? Is he upset? Is he angry? They say, now when you come back, you jump through these hoops, or we're going to walk all the way back so that you're so tired and you're aching and you're sore and you'll never run away again. No, what does he do? The shepherd rejoices. Somebody say amen. amen. I've heard it said that some shepherds, they'll, they'll carry them back and they'll break their leg to keep them from running away. That's not a good shepherd. Amen. <laughs> I can't find that anywhere in Psalm 23, but I, I've heard that before. God doesn't hurt people. Somebody say amen. 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 So let's talk about the person who wanders off and sins. I've heard people say, well, then they were never saved in the first place. And that's the first thing right out of the gate. Well, they were never saved. All right. You ever heard that? <laughs> a lot of religious people will throw that out there. Well, they, they were never saved. They never had a relationship with God. So I want to show you something. Just because you sin doesn't mean that you're not saved. 1 John 3, verse 9 from the New Living Translation. This is going to help you. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a what? Practice. Say it loud. Practice. A practice of sinning. Because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So when you see someone sinning, they were either never saved or they're sinning for a short while and they'll be back. Because they don't make a practice of it. They might have stumbled, they might have fallen, but the shepherd's going to get them back up, put him on his shoulders and come back rejoicing. Somebody say amen. 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 So how can we say this? Because when you belong to the family of God, you don't make a practice of sinning. That person will come back. That, that, just, that encourages me because I know there's hope for people that have wandered off. Because I know they had an encounter with God. I know they're saved. But they're not going to make a practice of it. They may de- take a detour. Don't raise your hand, but have you taken a detour? I have. <laughs> yeah, all right, go ahead. You're raising your hands. Romans six fourteen. Just look at your neighbor and say, I'm back, baby. <laughs> for sin shall not have dominion over you is that awesome for you are not under law but under grace how do you know that you're under grace and not the law sin doesn't have power over you if you are enslaved to sin then you're not under grace i'm not talking about messing up and sinning i'm talking about if you're enslaved there are people right now enslaved to it then they don't understand grace well, Joe, are you telling everybody it's all right to sin? No. No. You're saying that, that there's a freedom to go do whatever we want because Jesus has us covered? No. When you say that, then you don't really understand what grace is. So I want, I'm going to take a drink. Is that cool? All right. I love this church. I can just be myself. Amen. And you can too. Somebody say Amen. amen. So I want to look at a city dog and a country dog real quick. This is going to help you. The city dog is living in a basement dwelling in New York City. 
all right? And every time that the door opens, that dog takes off 90 miles an hour, right? So when the master takes the dog outside, he has to keep him on a leash, and any time that dog is outside, it's on a chain. But the country dog, he's just running around the farm. He could take off for 100 miles and never come back, ever. He has the freedom to take off. But every evening, without a chain, without bondage, you will find him on the porch next to his master in the rocking chair. Everybody say, that's freedom. That's freedom. That's That's the difference between the law and grace. When you understand grace, you will always be at the foot of the master because you understand he feeds me. He protects me. I'm not going to use this freedom to run off 100 miles this way. You're going to find me right here because he takes care of me. He protects me. Somebody say amen. Amen. Galatians 5.13. For you, brethren, have been called to, called to liberty, which is freedom. Only do not use liberty, your freedom, as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You brethren have been called to liberty. So we're like the dog out in the country. You have all this freedom, but you're not going to use it to satisfy your sinful nature. Where where are you going to find me? At the foot of the master. Even if I wander off a little bit and I get messed up, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm right there. Does that make sense? That dog doesn't use the freedom to do what he wants. The freedom makes him love his master even more. Our freedom is in knowing that our salvation and relationship with God is not based upon our performance. And even though I mess up, even though I might fail and sin, I may fall, I run back to my master because he's the one who set me free from the chains of slavery to the law. The law had me chained. The law had me bound. So I'm like that dog. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt not. Well, maybe I ought to go try that. You get jerked back. Are you with me? Now the freedom of God's grace, you're on the front porch and you could go do that, but I'm not going to use my freedom to satisfy my sinful nature. Now we know what Paul was talking about, right? Somebody say amen. 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 That means I don't have to jump through religious hoops anymore. I don't have to prove to anybody that I'm a good Christian. I know who I am. The cool thing about being close to the, the Father at His feet is He lets me know who I am. So he says, Joe, you're not that person that runs off 100 miles that way and gets into trouble. This is who you are. And he begins to speak from his word, from his heart to my heart, letting me know who I am. Are you with me? He says, no longer do I call you servant, now I call you friend. And you're sitting at my feet and I'm ministering to you and I'm talking to you. And two hearts become one. Does that make sense? Somebody say amen. 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 That spiritual liberty makes me want to get as close as I can to the one who has given me this freedom. Everybody say, that's grace. Man, I'm about to shout. I can't help it. Luke 15. Let's keep on going. Verses 6 and 7. You just feel a freedom? The chains of religion just fall off. Amen? (laughs) It's so awesome. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Who does the rejoicing? The shepherd, right? The one who does the finding. When God found you, it's not to discipline you. It's not to harm you. It's not to to hurt you. He was rejoicing when you got saved and all of heaven joined in. Amen? Amen. Psalm 23, 1 through 6. We're going to keep on moving. I want to show you some some other things today. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Who's our shepherd? Lord. Lord. So I I shall not want means I have need of nothing. I don't need anything. Verse 2. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Just leave it right there just for a second. I'm going to read this the way I read it to myself. You ready? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Who is doing all the work? He, the shepherd. 
We've been taught, Joe, you got to do this, and you got to do that, and you got to do this, but we haven't stopped long enough to read our Bibles. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Somebody say amen. Now watch this. Yea, though I... Oh, wait a minute. It was he, he, he. But now I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes we get into the valley of the shadow of death on our own. You see that? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for it. Here it is again. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All of the responsibilities on the shepherd. Somebody say amen. Amen. So sometimes we have to go through some detox, right? (laughs) Because we're taught many times that the shepherd's rod is to keep us in line. But as a five-year-old little boy sitting in church, I was like, how does that comfort me to get beat on? (laughs) All right? How does the rod and the staff, how do they comfort me if he's whipping me with it all the time? All right, we're going to keep on moving. Are you doing all right? The rod that the shepherd carries is to beat the wolves, not the sheep. The shepherd uses the rod to protect the sheep. They also carry a staff with a a crook on the end. Israeli shepherds can throw that staff like a javelin just at the wolves, all right, to protect them. The shepherd uses the staff sometimes to pick up the, the, the lamb, the little lamb that's fallen down into a ravine. It has that crook on the end so he can reach down and pull them back up. So now we can read it and say, your rod and your staff, they comfort me because you're protecting me. You're keeping me safe. Does that make sense? Nowhere in Psalm 23 do we see the shepherd abusing the sheep. Somebody say amen. Amen. Don't let anyone tell you God hurts his people. God will beat you to teach you a lesson. We don't see that anywhere in here. This is the place to put it. The shepherd will break the sheep's legs to keep him from running away. I've heard that, but it's not in here. All right? He's the great shepherd. He cares for the sheep. Matthew 9, 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. When Jesus saw them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Notice the result of not having a shepherd. They were weary and scattered. And scattered. But what happens when you have a shepherd? This is where I want to focus today. It's the last couple of minutes with you. Jeremiah verse or Jeremiah twenty three verses one through four. I released this on a video when we weren't able to have church, just as an encouragement. So we're going to break it down a little bit more. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. So now we're we're going to look at end time shepherds. Everybody say end time shepherds. This is the end time pastor God is raising up in grace churches. There's the end time churches he's raising up. That's not teaching the law and grace mix, but teaching grace. So this is what begins to happen in your life when you find an end time church with an end time shepherd. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. God always gathers, the enemy always scatters, all right? Verse two, therefore thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. So he's talking to pastors and leaders. You have scattered my flock and driven them away and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. Look at your neighbor and say, God only knows increase. God only knows increase. increase. We're going to get in. I cannot wait for next week. It's going to be awesome. All right. Verse four, I will set up shepherds over them. So God says, I'm going to begin in the last days, I'm going to begin to draw my people. And that's my prayer when I'm in here by myself is, Lord, bring your people to freedom. The ones that are destined to be here. We don't need everybody, just the ones that you've assigned to be here. Lord, everybody just say, bring them in. Bring them in. in. I will set up shepherds over them. I'll set up pastors and leaders over them who will what? Who will feed them. If a shepherd is abusive and you leave the service feeling depleted and beat up, get out. Amen. One amen. All right. I will set up shepherds over them who will beat them. No, feed them. A good shepherd feeds the sheep. He never beats the sheep. Amen. 
Now, I want you to notice there are three results of true feeding. When you find the church, an end-time church with an end-time shepherd, three things happen. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. So you're going to be fed. Here's what begins to happen when you are fed. They shall fear no more. If you're truly being fed a steady diet of the word of God, your fear has to leave because perfect love casts out fear. This is why you need to sit under a ministry of love, not condemnation. Because love casts out fear. Amen? Amen. A ministry of condemnation, of guilt, fire and brimstone won't get rid of fear. Actually, it attracts it. Right? Remember Psalm 23, I will fear no evil. Everybody say no fear. No fear. So one of the results of having a good shepherd is that you don't live in fear anymore. Somebody say amen. Amen. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. This is what happens when you're truly fed. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. That means you won't be discouraged. Do you know that it's impossible to be discouraged with yourself if you don't put your faith in yourself? (laughs) If you put your faith in you and your actions, you're going to be discouraged all the time. Right? Because this is what happens. I'm going to read my Bible every day. All right, I'm going to do this every day for a week. And you go to bed, you wake up the next morning, you don't even think about it halfway through the work day. Oh, I didn't read yesterday. What happens? Guilt. All right? I'm going to start praying 30 minutes a day. I'm going to show God that I'm serious. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you miss a day, guilt. Because you have all the focus on you and your behavior. Are you with me? You're putting your faith in what you can do. And when you mess up, and you probably will, you fall into discouragement and disappointment. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I'm going to read the Bible the whole way through this year, and you make it till January 2nd. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) Usually make it through January, February, and March, and then it's starting to look nice out. The weather's getting better. Oh, the Bible can wait. I'm just kidding. I'm teasing you. But that's what we do, and then we, if we put our faith in ourselves, we're in trouble. Does that make sense? sense. The gospel of grace is Jesus being our everything, having no confidence in me, no confidence in my flesh. Just say this, Christ is my all in all. That means I rejoice in Christ and what he's done. My faith is in what he's done, not in my behavior. Do I want to read my Bible? Yes. Do I want to pray? Yes. But when I mess up, I don't feel guilty. Same with communion. We want to take it every day. We miss some days. We don't go, oh, man, ruined my day. I missed it. Right? No, everybody say no condemnation. <laughs> no condemnation. Amen. You know I'm telling you the truth, don't you? Christ is my righteousness. He's my holiness. Amen. So the first result of true feeding is you will fear no more, neither will you be dismayed, nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. That means that you're going to begin to walk in prosperity. Do not be scared of that word. Everybody say prosperity. Prosperity. Say it loud. Prosperity. Prosperity. Why, Why do you begin to walk in prosperity? Why are you not lacking? Because you're receiving God's word on sowing. Giving, tithing, laws of increase and abundance. You'll hear about the blessing of Abraham. You'll hear that Jesus became poor so that you could be made rich. Because an end time shepherd will preach the entire Bible, not skip through it. Amen. I don't preach tithing to get your money. I preach about tithing so that you can be blessed. A lot of pastors are scared to death to talk about it because peop, religious people say he's after my money. You can say that. I'm not. I'm just telling you what's worked in my life. If it works for me, it's going to work for you. Somebody say amen. Tithing is actually a revelation. It's a revelation. If you don't have the revelation, if you don't want to tithe, don't tithe. Because your guilt tithe doesn't work. You're not going to be blessed out of guilty tithing. But once you receive the revelation, man, I, God, I just want to give you 10%, and I'm going to give you over that as just an offering. Once you get that, nobody can talk you out of it. Amen? Amen? It's so awesome. Same with communion. Once you get the revelation, it's, it's for my healing. Nobody can talk you out of it. Everybody say revelation. That's why revelation is so important. I don't come just to learn a bunch of facts on Sunday. I want a revelation. I want God to lift the veil so that I know what he's saying to my heart. Because then you can argue, you can debate, but you're not changing my heart. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Amen? See, a lot of people approach Christianity and, and learning from the word so that they can win an argument. I don't want to win an argument. I want my life to change. 
my life has changed, so now I go back and I'm showing you everything I've learned. Not a bunch of information. I'm giving you revelation. Do you receive it this morning? Yes. Somebody say amen. 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 So with all of these things that we've learned, let's read this again. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, this discouraged, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Learning that, all pastors ought to be saying, Lord, what do you want me to teach? Because when we teach what he tells us, this is what happens to the local church. Are you blessed? Yes. Amen. All right, verses 5 and 6. We're going to wrap it up here really quickly. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called. Read that together. The Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. What does a true shepherd preach? Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness. Is that what I preach? Is it your righteousness? No. The person next to you? Yeah. Whose? The Lord's. the Lord's righteousness. Amen. The more I preach that Jesus is our righteousness and he paid it all, the more I, I point to him and the finished works on the cross, your fear vanishes, your discouragement leaves, and you won't be lacking anything because my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Amen? Amen. Well, Joe, you don't look very righteous. No, <laughs> but he is. You don't act very righteous. He is. Are you with me? Joe, are you saying that you're perfect and you never mess up? No, I'm saying Jesus is perfect and he never messed up. And he's my high priest standing in my place, remember, representing me to the heavenly father. Somebody say amen. amen. Point to three people, say that's grace. that's grace. That means we can't boast in our own righteousness. We boast in Christ's righteousness. This is what an end time pastor or shepherd teaches. Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness. It's his righteousness. I want to close with this. Do you know that your prosperity hinges upon your revelation of God's righteousness? Your prosperity, being blessed financially, hinges upon your revelation of God's righteousness. Matthew 6, the last verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. All the things mentioned in Matthew 6 leading up to verse 33, all of these things are added to you if you what? Seek first the kingdom of God. That's what a lot of people teach. Just seek first the kingdom of God and all these things, but we leave out. An end time shepherd will teach Jesus, the Lord, our righteousness. So when I seek the kingdom of God first, when I seek his righteousness first, God says, I'll add everything else. You don't have to chase money. You don't have to chase cars. You don't have to chase houses. You don't have to chase anything. My God shall supply all of my needs. He's going to bless me. Somebody say amen. 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 Look at your neighbor and say, you're supposed to be blessed. You're supposed to be blessed. I like going hard after that because there's a group of people who, man, they fight hard not to be blessed. They do. So I made a deal with the Lord. Anybody who doesn't believe in prosperity, I'll take theirs. <laughs> Well, why not, right? If you don't believe and you're not going to receive it, I'll take it. I believe it. Amen. Look at your neighbor one more time. So you're supposed to be blessed. Somebody says, well, you're not supposed to have a big bank account and a flashy car and all that. Maybe not, but I don't think we're supposed to be broke, busted, and disgusted either. Amen. If you can, we talked about this last week, if you can claim all the scriptures about being persecuted and about being broken and hurting, all those, why not take all the financial ones, all of the blessings? The blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow. The blessing of the Lord makes rich, that means he's going to bless you financially, and he adds no sorrow. The world to get rich, to get money, they, there's sorrow that comes with it because they ripped that guy off, and they stepped on that guy, and they abused that business, and they did that. Here comes the sorrow. It's cost them family members. It's cost them marriages. Everybody say sorrow. The blessing of the Lord maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. That means he blesses me financially when I begin to get the revelation. Here, Uh-oh, here we go. When I receive the revelation of tithing and sowing and giving, and I get it in my heart, and I just don't do it because Joe told me, but I get it in my heart and I start to do it, the blessing of the Lord makes rich. Here comes all kinds of blessing into my life. Anybody living it? Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise this morning.